Raspberry Pi Imager is the easiest and official way that you can use to write an operating system onto an SD card that you can then use in a Raspberry Pi. Now, in the last week or so, a new version of this has been released, and it's got some really nice new functionality and some not so good stuff as well. Let's go and take a look right here on Jeff's Pie in the Sky. Now, if you've been using a Raspberry Pi for as long as I have, you'll know that Raspberry Pi Imager isn't exactly brand new software. It's been around for a really long time, but that doesn't change the fact it's still the easiest software that you can use to download an operating system, write it to an SD card that you can then put into your Raspberry Pi and boot from it. Now, the new version that's been released doesn't do anything revolutionary, but it is still a really handy upgrade. If you installed the Raspberry Pi software through your operating system software manager, then you can just upgrade it from there as well. However, if, like me, you downloaded the package independently of your package manager, all you've got to do is go to this website, raspberrypi.com forward slash software, and it will take you to this page here, where you can then just hit the link for downloading it. Now, depending on what operating system you're running, the download link will be custom to that. If you went to the website on a Windows machine, then it would be saying download for Windows. However, if you do need to download it for a different platform, you can see there are links down here as well. In this case, I'm just going to click the button to download for Linux, since that's the platform that I'm running on. Now, if I run this command here to list all the packages that I've got installed and look specifically for RPI Imager, you can see that the version I've got here is 1.8.5. Now, this is a little bit old since there is a 1.9.4 around, but for the purpose of this video, it's just important to know that I am running an older version. And before we can install the new version, we actually have to uninstall the old version. So here I have to run sudo apt remove rpi imager and then confirm with y. I then have to make the file I just downloaded executable with chmod plus x imager underscore 2.0.0 underscore amd64 dot app image, where the A and the I of app image are capitalized. But what's nice about this app image file is that you can run it as a completely self-contained application. There's nothing to install as such. So in order to run it, all we have to do is execute sudo, since the imager needs super user permissions on your system, dot slash imager underscore 2.0.0 underscore amd64 dot app image. And the application opens straight up. Now, what you can see here immediately with the software is that the UI has been changed quite substantially. It's now based around a kind of wizard system where you have all of the steps that you need to go through listed down the left hand side. And this includes all of the stuff that was hidden behind the edit settings button of the old version. But it just means you need to click through these one at a time. So here for my device, if I just select Raspberry Pi 5 and hit next, you can see me now drop down to the OS section. And here I want to select that I want to install Raspberry Pi OS 64 bit. And again, hit next. And now it shows us the storage devices that are available for us to write our operating system onto. So here I'm going to pick my SanDisk Ultra 32 gig SD card. And again, hit next. And this is now where it takes us through the customization section that you'd normally find in the edit settings section. So the first thing you do here is provide a host name for your Raspberry Pi. I'm just going to call this one Imager. And then on my network, this will show up with the host name Imager.local. The next section is about localization. And there's actually been quite a few complaints about this. Because as you can see, that your location is now driven by the capital city of your country. And that defaults to Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And this is despite the fact it's picked up my time zone as being London and my keyboard layout as GB. So it's a little bit strange that it's then defaulted to Abu Dhabi. But that's OK, because you can drop the box down, drag the scroll bar down, 
until you get to your capital city. It just seems to be a strange decision to drive the settings that way. Especially when you consider places like the United States, where if you lived in Los Angeles, you can't find it anymore in the menu. And instead you'd have to select Washington DC, which is about three and a half thousand miles away. Now, granted, it's then picked up the time zone as at least being in America. But again, the fact that it defaults to East Coast does mean that if you are in the West Coast of the States, you've then got to open this up and then select your location. And this is just awkward. The other thing that I've got a real gripe about is the fact that if I do drop this down and I just use the wheel at the middle of my mouse to scroll up and down, I find this really hard to control. It does what's called natural scrolling. So if I scroll down, then the list goes up. And if I scroll up, then the list goes down. Now, this is the opposite of how I normally set my scroll bars. So the fact that the application does it this way is pretty infuriating. Equally, here I'm trying to find London, but I've naturally scrolled to New Delhi. So if I scroll my mouse wheel down just one click, you can see it's actually gone too far. And now London is lower down in this list. Equally, if I tick up one click, you can see I'm back in New Delhi. So the only way that I can get to London is by grabbing the scroll bar and then moving slowly up until I get to the place that I want. And in this case, that's still not actually set my time zone automatically, even though it did when I selected America earlier. So I've got to drop this one down now and then go find my local time zone. So I think the user interface for this section really does need some work. But if you hit next, it then asks you for a username for your Raspberry Pi. And I'll just use the age old default user, even if that isn't the most secure thing in the world. You can then set your wireless network SSID and password. But for this particular Raspberry Pi, I've got a wired connection. So I'm going to skip over this. It then gives you a couple of options for remote access. The first of these is to enable SSH so that you can log in across the network. If I hit next on this, it then asks if I want to enable Raspberry Pi Connect. This is actually a really cute feature. Raspberry Pi Connect lets you get to the graphical desktop of your Raspberry Pi via a browser from any other machine on your network. Or indeed, you can be anywhere in the world. So if I enable this, it then asks me for an authentication token. To get this, I just have to click this link here to open Raspberry Pi Connect. And this then takes me to the Raspberry Pi Connect website. And here, I can just click this button to create a new authentication key and launch Raspberry Pi Imager. And just like in all good demos, this hasn't actually worked on this occasion. It's meant to then automatically paste in the authentication token into this box. Now, if I go back to the Raspberry Pi Connect web page and under settings, I can see the auth keys. I can see that it has generated this one, but it doesn't tell me what it is or let me copy paste it into the app. So all I can do here is delete the auth key and then create a new one. I can then copy that by clicking the button and I can finally paste that into my authentication token box. And I haven't bothered hiding this because this key has got an expiration of six hours time and I'll actually be publishing this video way after then. So I can just click next and then it confirms if I want to write the image. And this is actually where there's another complaint about the application. A lot of people have said that this is actually slower than the original version. So first off, I'm going to run up the original version so we can time how long it takes to write the same Raspberry Pi OS image with the same configuration. So let's kick this off and see how long it takes on the old Raspberry Pi Imager to write our operating system to the SD card. OK, I'm going to stop it there at the verifying stage because that is only reading data from the SD card. It's no longer writing to it. So there you can see that the write operation took pretty much exactly four minutes. And so now that we know it took almost precisely four minutes for the old version of Raspberry Pi Imager to write the image to the SD card. So let's now see how long it takes Raspberry Pi Imager 2 to write the image to the SD card.
And again, just stopping this as it starts the verification step, you can see it actually took 3 minutes 55. So in my case, it's actually been a little bit quicker. Now, according to the people that make the Imager software, people who've got older SD cards and SD card writers may experience it taking longer to write their SD card. And the reason for this is that they've increased the amount of verification they put in as they're going through the write process. Now, in my case, I'm using a SanDisk Ultra 32 gig SD card, and I'm also using a USB 3 SD writer. So maybe that's why I'm able to avoid these problems and actually see a very small decrease in write time. But let me know in the comments what your experience is. Do you find Raspberry Pi Imager 2 taking just as long to write your SD card? Or is it leaving you hanging around for ages? Now, one thing I have found a little bit strange is that since this software has been released, it looks like they haven't updated what gets automatically downloaded to your Raspberry Pi if you try to fire up the installer from its boot process. So here I've got a Raspberry Pi 5 and it's not got any storage attached to it at all. And you can see here it's asking me to press the shift key on the keyboard and then this will download and fire up the OS installer. And here you can see that it is downloading the installer dynamically. So I would have expected this to be the latest version. However, what you can see here is that it is the old version with the old UI. Now this is by no means a terrible thing at all, and I'm sure they will update it in time. But I'm just quite surprised that they haven't done it already. I would have thought they'd be wanting as many people to use the new version as possible. And so whilst I really like Raspberry Pi Imager version 2, I like the new layout of it because I always want to apply those settings to any Raspberry Pi OS install that I do. But there are just a few gremlins there. I really hate the menu system around the localization options. The selection process for that just doesn't seem to be well thought out. And especially for American users, or indeed anyone in any country that spans a bunch of different time zones, I feel that selecting your localization options has suddenly been made an awful lot more difficult for no good reason. And equally, not making the new version of the tool available when you fire up a Raspberry Pi and hold down the shift key to dynamically download the installer. Well, that just seems crazy. It's almost sending the message that they'd prefer that you use the old version, which is surely not the case. But that's it for this video. As always, I'll be really grateful if you can like this and subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you can be told when I put a new video out. And do let me know in the comments what your experience with the new Raspberry Pi Imager is. Do you really like it? Do you hate it? Are there things that you want changed? The more you comment on videos like this, not only does it help the channel of course, but it also helps promote the message when you're unhappy with something. People like the manufacturers of the Imager software do take comments like that into account as they're figuring out what changes to make. But one last personal request before I go, if you could see it in your heart to use the hype functionality of YouTube to promote my channel, I'd really appreciate it. You can hype up to three channels in a week, and small channels like mine can really benefit from that, as YouTube will use that information and put our videos in front of more people. I'm still trying to get to 5,000 subscribers by the end of the year, so any help that you can provide I'd be extremely grateful. Thanks so much for watching till the end, and until next time, bye for now.